Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another Egypt Ocean webinar. My name is Lotte Birkema. I'm a um, senior policy officer at Ocean Energy Europe. Ocean Energy Europe is the coordinator of Egypt Ocean, the European technology and um, innovation platform for ocean energy. And today our topic is um, how to reduce cost and risk through practical experience in the application of standards. And we have a full panel today, um, really interesting discussions um, to, to listen to. Um, just a couple of words about EGIP Ocean. So this is a really um, a network for sharing experience and, and knowledge and learnings across across the um, ocean energy sector. So this is what we're doing with these webinars and workshops. And we also um, do work on prioritizing research and innovation topics for the sector to accelerate the development and pathway to, um, to, to the market. And this topic on, on standards and certification was um, identified as one of the priority topics in the in the current research, uh, strategic research and innovation agenda. And um, that is the, the background for this webinar. And I will I would like to ask Pablo Ruiz Minguela from Technalia to introduce this SRIA um, and, the, and the topic in a bit um, uh, in a bit closer. So Pablo, um, I let you take the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lotta, for this introduction. I want to share my screen, uh, see if it works. I think this might be. Yeah, hope that you can see my screen. Yes, perfect. Uh, uh, I see a lot of screens uh, here, but uh, yes, uh, my name is Pablo Ridmingela. I work at Technalia as a head of wave energy uh, technologies and projects. Um, we've been collaborating with OEE in the development of the SREA. Um, the webinar yeah, is already introduced by Lota. And what I want to yeah, say, I'll try to move the, some of the pop-up <laughs> menu that block my side of the screen. Um, I was saying that the uh, strategic research and um, I'm going to make a, a very short introduction of the strategic research and innovation agenda for ocean energy. This is a reference document uh, for the whole ocean energy sector, and it is specifically specifically targeted for public funding organizations with the aim of inspiring research calls. Um, it's not, uh, it, it didn't come from a scratch, it's uh, updated previously uh, developed documents and a strategic agenda um, in 2016. And the document has the aim to define the specific objectives and actions to curve the path towards ocean energy commercialization. Um, it is a document that has been closely developed uh, with uh, all sector stakeholders, and it was officially launched in 2020 covering basically the period between 2021 and 2025. There is a link uh, to download at the ETIP Ocean website uh, if you are not aware of the document where you can download it. Um, the S uh, SREA is a structure around challenge areas and each challenge area is an R&D field that the ocean energy sector has identified as the most worthy of investment during the next period uh, covering 2021-2025. Um, professionals have agreed that the, the, the most urgent and crucial area is the design and validation of ocean energy devices, and other areas should support this one, such as foundations and connections and mooring, logistics and marine operations, integration in the energy system and data collection, analysis and modeling tools, to name a few. Um, 
the projects uh, that fit within these challenge areas should contribute to the expected impacts described in each of the priority topics uh, and demonstrate also a wider impact on the European Green Deal objectives. Uh, these priority topics um, um, are uh, specified uh, the uh, scope, the applicability, either wave, tidal, all the uh, types of technologies, so of all of them, the actions, the expected impact uh, to be achieved through the projects, the entry and exit TRL, and the budget required, uh, which roughly with an indication, a rough indication of the number and size of projects. Um, so there you go in the screen, the, the priority topics, I won't get into detail on all of these, you can have uh, downloaded uh, the document in order to browse it and investigate more about them. Uh, what I mentioned is that today's webinar is framed within the cross-cutting challenges and more specifically, the standardization and certification priority topic. This is a, a, a topic that wants to contribute to advancing towards more widely accepted standards and associated certification procedures. And the aim is to facilitate coherent development and assessment of technologies. Actions that fit within this uh, priority topic is uh, gathering best practices and applying experience gained in other industries, assessing guidelines, specifications, and standards in real case open sea projects. And I think we will learn a bit after my presentation on this. Uh, develop internationally recognized standards in collaboration with international bodies. And we have Jonathan Colby, one of these representatives, and also in involving investors and utilities, insurance providers and regulators in the definition of those standards. With um, this priority topic, we expect to uh, improve those technical specifications, guidance and standards, have a more widespread application of them, and reduce the cost of insurance and capital for projects. So that's my presentation for today. Thank you. And I pass uh, the floor to Lota. Thank you very much, Pablo. So without further ado, uh, let's jump into um, today's uh, presentation. So I would like to hand it over to our moderator, Jonathan Colby. Uh, who will introduce the topic a bit more and um, and then the speakers. And just um, before doing that, to let you know that this webinar is being recorded, so you can also um, get the, the slides and the recording after today's webinar. And if you have any questions, you can write those in the Q&A box and we will take questions after the presentations. So with that, Jonathan Colby, um, please, the floor is yours. For that perfect segue and introduction into our topic today. Um, we have three additional amazing panelists. Um, I'm going to start with a little bit of discussion about the state of the art globally, talking about TC114 and marine energy, as well as the certification activities going on in our sector. We're going to have Caroline Laurie from the European Marine Energy Center to share her perspectives from a test lab one of the key stakeholders in both the standards development and the certification activities. We'll hear from Cristina Martinez Lozano with Magallanes Renovables, a title energy developer who will share her perspective from the developer side of the importance and the role that standards and certification play in commercializing their technology. And then we'll finish with Jonathan Hodges from Wave Energy Scotland, where you'll hear the perspective of a funding agency and the role that standards and certification play from a funding agency as they look at, at de-risking some of their financial investments and helping to bring technologies up to that commercial stage. So it's an honor to be here today. Um, again, thank you for the invitation and the chance to moderate. And without further ado, we will get started. Um, let's do this. Hopefully you should see my screen now. Yes, we can see it. Excellent, good. Well. So again, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jonathan Colby. I'm the founder and president of Streamwise Development. 
Formerly, I worked at Verdant Power, a tidal energy device developer based in the United States. But today I really am coming as uh, the chair of TC114, which we'll talk about today. It's the International Standard Body for Marine Energy, as well as the convener of the marine energy sector of the IECRE, which is the Conformity Assessment System for Renewable Energy. So I'll talk today about both standards and certification from the international perspective. And in particular, I'll frame how standards and certification can reduce risk in the ocean energy sector. Again, as Pablo nicely sort of set up and started for us, standards and certification play a significant and important role in the commercialization of the ocean energy sector. The standards or technical specifications that are developed are consensus-based documents that ensure a uniform best practice approach is applied and they use a common language to, in, to facilitate communication between different countries, different developers, and different stakeholders. And the application of standards enable direct technology comparisons within the marketplace. Now certification is the sort of flip and, and complementary part of standards. And this is the third party verification of compliance to those standards. Certification in these types of activities can improve the terms and access to financing and insurance as Pablo touched on, it utilizes an independent entity with expertise to verify compliance. And I hope that we'll hear more about that today from Caroline. Ultimately, using an international third party system such as the IECRE provides the highest level of confidence in the marketplace while reducing risk to all of the stakeholders involved. And ultimately this can reduce and will reduce barriers to global markets for the technology developers themselves. So in the ocean energy or marine energy as it's called, the International Electrotechnical Commission or the IEC operates Technical Committee 114 entitled Marine Energy, Wave, Tidal and Other Water Current Converters. As I mentioned, I have the honor of serving as the chair of TC 114 the technical committee is made up of more than 200 subject matter experts from more than from 29 countries. Our work is broken down into 18 working groups, and we do have a publicly available set of terms that is available online. Uh, I assume these slides will be shared afterwards, so that link is there, or you can Google the IEV part 417. We also have a number of key liaisons, including with other renewable energy sectors, other groups within ISO or the International Standards Organization. But one of our key liaisons is with the International Energy Agency and their ocean energy system. And so later in, later in today's webinar, Jonathan will talk a bit about the perspective of the OES or the ocean energy system and how these two groups work together to complement each other in the development of the sector. Now a picture tells a thousand words. Here are the 17 participating member countries. You can see we have strong representation from the major European and Asian markets, as well as North America. However, we have a significant gap in participation from our colleagues in South America and Africa. And as chair, one of my key initiatives over the next one to three years is to increase our engagement, in particular from our colleagues in Central and South America. For those familiar, there's the Pan-American Marine Energy Conference, or PAMEC, and there's also a network known as the REMAR network, which connects Portugal and Spain with the Latin American Spanish-speaking countries of Central and South America. And so I'm working to leverage both the PAMEC event as well as the REMAR network to increase our engagement with, again, Central and South American countries, which have a significant amount of activity in the ocean energy sector. TC114 also includes a series of observer members. These are shown here. This basically covers the rest or, or most of our colleagues in Europe. We see we also have some of our Eastern European colleagues, Middle Eastern colleagues. And here we do have Brazil involved. But again, it's a major gap that we only have one Central and South American country involved in the work of TC114. Now quickly, our the standards that we write, I see is broken into two main types. One type are the resource agnostic standards. So these are standards that apply to river, 
tidal, wave, all types of technology. And so you can see they include design, the measurement of loads, the assessment of power quality, the characterization of acoustic emissions. And our newest standard, which I wanted to bring attention to, is on the characterization of marine growth and biofouling. So if any of you are interested in participating in this new work on characterizing biofouling, we welcome your engagement as well as your connection with any of these other standards. So in addition to the resource agnostic standards, we have a suite of resource specific standards. And so these include the ocean thermal, as you can see at the top, but then we have a suite of standards that are focused on wave energy devices or WECs. We have a suite of standards centered on tidal energy devices or TECs. And then we have a suite of standards focused on river energy devices or RECs. And so, you know, a bit of terminology difference. I know here we talk about ocean energy, but at TC114, we talk about marine energy. And that marine energy here does include river energy, um, not conventional hydropower, but here we're talking about run of river or taking advantage of the naturally moving kinetic energy of rivers globally. So if I pivot now to certification, again, certification or third-party verification is done through consensus-based international standards. And this third-party verification can reduce risk, can improve market access, and ultimately will support the commercialization of the marine energy industry. In 2014 and working together since, marine solar photovoltaic and the wind energy sectors joined forces to develop a system for the certification of renewable energy equipment, the RE system. In marine energy, we have six member bodies or countries, and we're working towards full certificates that could be issued against prototypes, components, a full type certificate, and eventually a project certificate. And within the system, the three main bodies are the certification bodies, the test labs, and the inspection bodies. And as we'll hear from the other panelists today, we'll hear a little bit about each of these different bodies and the important role they play in certification and in the ultimate commercialization of the system. Now, again, looking at photos, the six member bodies are shown here. We have in the North America, the United States. We have the UK, Belgium, France, and Italy and Europe, and Japan and Asia. As you'll see, we have significantly fewer countries involved in the certification. And this is one of my goals is to grow the membership of this community. Now, if we superimpose here some of the participating labs, you can see that we have some of the key test labs globally, including EMEC, which we'll hear from today in Caroline. We have the key French certification bodies in Bureau Veritas. We have Class NK in Japan, Lloyd's Register in the UK and then the American Bureau of Shipping in the United States. So really some of the key participants globally are involved in these certification activities. One example before I pass it on, in 2021, when I was still at Verdant Power, Verdant worked with EMEC, or the European Marine Energy Center, to assess independently the power performance of the Verdant Power tri-frame. And so EMEC, as a recognized test lab, oversaw the entire process of the application of the DASH 200 standard as published by TC114. In 2021, EMEC issued the first ever renewable energy test report. The link is here once the slides are available. You can find the cover letter publicly available. But as you can imagine, the full report is protected as it contains a significant amount of intellectual property. So I just wanted to share an example of the application of the standards and certification with a developer and a test laboratory in the global uh, marketplace. So I'll just summarize the standards of TC114 ensure a common language, they codify best global practices, and they provide the detailed how-to for the industry. The certification side provides harmonized rules for testing and certification activities. This work ultimately reduces barriers to trade and enables market access and ultimately increases confidence in the technology. And so hopefully I've set the stage for how standards and certification can reduce risk and accelerate the path to commercialization for this technology. 
So thank you all for this chance. And with that, I'll turn the floor over to Caroline and we'll hear the perspective of EMAC and of Test Lab in the marketplace. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. Can you all okay and see the screen there? Not yet the screen, but I can hear you just fine. Excellent. Yep, you're good to go, Caroline. Excellent. Okay. Um, so my name is Caroline Lowry. Um, I'm a chartered mechanical engineer with over 20 years of experience in the subsea um, and power engineering industries uh, with a strong focus on renewables. I joined EMEC in Orkney in January 2022 as the technical manager um, and I have responsibility as part of that for the performance test engineering, so the performance uh, power performance assessments, for example. Um, a quick introduction to EMEC. Um, EMEC was founded in 20, uh, sorry, 2003 in Orkney um, to provide a test centre for the emergent marine energy uh, industry within the UK and Europe. Um, since its founding, it has received approximately £39 million worth of funding uh, from grant funded and commercial projects. Uh, EMEC is the only accredited wave and tidal test centre for marine renewable energy in the world and we're an accredited test laboratory to ISO 17025 and an accredited inspection body to ISO 17020. And more marine energy devices have been tested at EMEC in Orkney than at any other single site location in the world. We have two uh, test, uh, scale test sites, um, which are located in Scapa Flow, uh, for wave and Chappancy sound for tidal. These sites provide a more flexible sea space and help to close the gap from tank testing and act as a stepping stone towards larger scale projects. Uh, this real sea uh, access um, enables marine developers to uh, learn the lessons more cheaply, um, reducing the need for big vessels and large plant. We have two grid connected test sites, one at Billia Crew, which is our wave site, um, and one in the, in the fall of one is off the island of Edie in Orkney for Tidal. Um, we can accommodate a wide, wide range of technologies across these sites, and they are pre-consented sites, so it means that the test and demonstration uh, can be done with reduced cost and risk for the developers. Um, so the Billia Crew site, um, is the uh, average height of waves we're looking at uh, sort of two to three meters and we've seen over 18 meters uh, as the sort of maximum which is around four double decker buses we have six grid connected berths there five in deep water um, and those are ranging from 50 to 70 meters um, and a near shore berth for shallow water projects we've got five 11 kv subsea power cables which feed back into the grid and have seven megawatts of export capacity for that site. At the fall of Warness, which was developed in 2006, um, we have high velocity currents, which reach around four meters per second, which is 7.8 knots at spring tides, which are equivalent to a car moving at around 10 miles per hour. Half a billion tons of water th flows through that site uh, per hour at the peak tide. We have seven grid connected test berths there and the subsea cables transport the electricity generated by the tide into the EMEX substation, then onto the national grid. And that site has four megawatt export capacity. The water depth there is between 12 and 50 meters. To date, we have tested 35 devices with 22 developers from 11 different countries. And we've had some world firsts, the first wave power in the world with Palamis, the first tidal energy in the UK with Open Hydro, as uh, I say, more tested here than anywhere else in the world. Looking then at the developer roadmap, um, this roadmap provides an overview of the stages the developer will go through in designing, testing, honing and perfecting their technology. For commercially successful technology, one that can be deployed at farm scale, generating power at expected levels, performing reliably and cost effectively, the journey starts in the laboratory, scaling up until it can be proven to work in a representative environment. We're really lucky today to have a developer here to talk about their experiences in the process and the role standards has played for them. EMEC works with developers at all stages of this journey and remains technology agnostic and independent. We've worked with IECRE to develop international standards for the assessment of marine energy devices where none existed previously. We talk about TRL, technology readiness level, and that takes it from basic concepts through to, you know, operationally field proven. 
it's really important for investor confidence. Um, and you will find that certain funding streams may be targeted for particular levels of developer. It's important to also consider, uh, as well as the technology readiness level, which is the concept of the actual technology, the commercial readiness level, which is how cost effective um, a technology will be to produce at scale, how ready it is for mass production. And the technology performance level, the reliability survivability type metrics, and I understand that Jonathan will be talking at the end of the presentation, Jonathan Hodges from WES, on that as well. So the accredited services, um, the IC technical specifications that Jonathan Colby has talked around already uh, for the marine energy converted converters were developed under the Interreg funded MET certified project as an accredited test lab and inspection body. EMET can provide accredited testing, inspection and power performance verification services at their own sites and remotely, as shown in that table there. These standards provide an industry agreed benchmark for technologies and an easy pathway, uh, they ease the pathway to certification. EMEC was awarded renewable energy te uh, test laboratory status by IECRE um, and is independently assessed by the United Kingdom Accreditation Service, UCAS, to ensure that quality and process are adhered to throughout the, uh, the processes we are involved in. Um, a note then about standards and certification. The technology certification is a key component in developing a mature industry, um, helping specifically to attract investment. Certification and third party verification is needed for insurance and investor confidence. This will drive the viability of the sector commercially. Whilst verification can be achieved independently, standards and certification routes provide an industry accepted pathway. The IECRE Renewable Energy Technology te uh, Test Laboratories can provide accredited test inspection services and are independently assessed, EMIC by uh, UCAS, as we said. Um, Accreditation can ease the path to certification. It's a bit like taking your high school exams before you attempt your uh, postgraduate degree. It reduces risk, improves technology performance and reliability, and promotes commercial investment. And the standards provide an industry agreed benchmark for the market to more effectively compete. Thanks for your time and attention. I'll now hand back to Jonathan to introduce the next presenter. Yeah, thank you so much for that perspective. Um, I can say I had the pleasure of being at EMEC in April of this year for a series of standards meetings. And the photos you show are not exactly the weather that we experienced, but it must be lovely when the weather is like that. <laughs> so thank you very much. With that, we'll turn the floor to Christina with Magallanes uh, and we'll hear the perspective of the vice developer. Christina, the floor is yours. Yeah, hello everyone. I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, is it, can you see it now? Yes, indeed, you're perfect, Cristina. Okay, cool. Um, hello everyone, I'm Cristina Martinez Lozano from Magallanes Renovables. And in the next slide, well, I'm going to talk about the Ocean Energy Certification, but from a developer's perspective, as you, uh, Jonathan has already mentioned. Um, I didn't introduce myself and my background because that's already going to be explained in this slide. So I work for EMEC for the European Marine Energy Center with Caroline as boss for uh, three years, uh, well, three years and a half, uh, which EMEC, as she has already explained, is a marine energy test site in Orkney and a RETL, which is a renewable energy test lab. So I was mainly working as performance test engineer, apart from metals engineer as well uh, previously. And I was doing accredited tests and inspections. Uh, as such, I did, well, following PC114, as such I did, um, I was part of the team doing bird and power performance assessment in 2020, following ICTS 6 to 600, uh, which is the technical specification for tidal energy converter resource assessment, sorry, um, power performance assessment. Um, then uh, in January 2023, so about five months ago, I moved. I wanted to change a bit the perspective instead of seeing the sector from the test site perspective, moved to developer's perspective. So I moved to Magallanes Renovables, which is a Spanish company based in Vigo. 
which has uh, the, this tight energy converter that is uh, shown in the picture called a tier 1.0, which is a 1.5 megawatt tech uh, in full of Warner, full of Warner's test site in, in IMEX since 2018. So yeah, I'm, I've been based in Orkney since 2018 and I'm still there. Uh, Magallanes Renewables is developing a, a tier 2.0, which is the, 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 in the image you can see it there. It's uh, being designed right now in 2023. And the construction will be take place during 2024. Um, hopefully, will be installed 2024, 2025. There's several projects, and uh, our idea is to certify this uh, technology. We will we're aiming to have it certified by 2026. Uh, so we are working on that, and that's mainly what I'm going to say now. Uh, so about certification in marine renewables. Um, this is something that has already been mentioned a bit by Jonathan and Caroline. It's a relatively new sector, unlike any other sectors like wind, uh, especially more mature ones. Uh, there are technical specifications like DC114, which is uh, for marine energy, wave, tidal, and other water current converters. And the purpose of this is collecting um, uh, best practice and uh, information for marine inspection, power performance assessment, resource assessment, power quality, any any kind of um, technical knowledge related to all, uh, the marine renewables. And already accreditation and certification bodies like Lloyd's Register or EMEC are, are already doing test uh, accredited services and certify, in certifying these technologies following these technical specifications, which mean that they are already being used. Um, the parts of these technical specifications are here. Um, Jonathan has already gone through them a bit more in detail. I'm not going to repeat them because it will be redundancy. But yeah, you can see there more or less um, some of them. And the main part that I'm going to, to explain is how these technical specifications are applied when, uh, when certifying a technology. So in our case, for the tier 2.0 that I mentioned that we are designing, we will have to run through these steps. And each of these steps is based on a technical specification of the ones that uh, Jonathan has presented. So for example, uh, first of all, well, our idea is to deploy an array of four tidal energy converters in more lights in, in Wales. And we are right now working on the resource assessment of the tidal energy, which would be following the DASH 201, which is for tidal um, resource assessment. Then the next step would be technology qualification, which is following the dashboard, which explains how to carry out, carry out the technology qualification. Then from that technology qualification will be developed a technology qualification plan, which will uh, line up which are the tests that need to be done on each of the different technology on each of the different aspects of the technology. So there will be things related to dash two, dash three, dash ten, dash thirty depending on whether it's based on the moorings or um, if it's based on the power quality or loads or any of the design. Um, from that moment, then will be a manufacturing plan, installation plan, and operation plan will be written, following also the, the best practice line uh, pointed out in these technical specifications. And the, the final step would be uh, carrying out a power performance assessment following the DAS 200, which is the same one as we did for Verdant Power uh, in 2020. So this is why the technical specifications are relevant for certification. And yeah, once the device is certified, then it's 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 a way in which investors will have more faith into putting money into it. Then for insurance, it's also much better. So it's important to to have the the technology certified. And then I'm going to talk about the, uh, the working groups, the feedback into the working groups. So I'm part of the TC114 work standards working group, which works on developing the standards. So these standards are updated, uh, need to be updated following the state of art, removing the unuseful or unpractical, unpractical parts so that these guidelines are um, feasible time-wise, economic, uh, econo economically and technology-wise. So, um, this needs to be done while you these standards are put in practice so that they are they are more close to reality. 
An example of this uh, is the floating tight energy converters, which I'm going to explain now. So this is um, an interesting point of the feedback into working groups, because when these standards were first developed, um, tidal energy converters were usually uh, seabed mounted, as you can see there in the picture, um, usually the ADCPs, which are the, the, um, the current measuring instruments, uh, were also seabed mounted, as well as the technology of the tidal energy converters. That way, it was the best way to measure the, the currents. And for power performance assessment, this was the way to do it. However, uh, right now, as you can see in the image on the bottom, uh, new technologies are moving towards floating structures. And in that case, it's more interesting to have the ADCPs floating installed on the platform rather than on the seabed. And these, well, these technical specifications for power performance assessment have had to be changed so that it's accepted as well to, to depending on the, which technology it is, to have the, the ATCPs mounted on the, on, the, on the tidal energy converters. This is just an example of many changes that um, the, the technical specifications go adding so that they are more close to reality and the state of art of this, um, this uh, industry. Uh, so that's my presentation. Any question, yes, let me know. And um, yeah, I'll be happy to help anyone. Thank you very much, Christina, for that excellent presentation. Um, quite nice to see that full path of the, the, of the way to certification. And yeah. it's a lot of work. Uh, you know, it's, as people can see, there are many standards and it's quite a, quite a process. But it's really reassuring to know that a developer like Magallanes sees the value and is looking into the future for that three to four year timeline to accomplish those steps to ensure their product is ready for the commercial marketplace. So thank yeah. you very much for sharing that developer's perspective. That's just what we needed. So with that, yes, thank you. Uh, with that, we'll turn it over to Jonathan Hodges with Wave Energy Scotland. We'll talk a bit about the ocean energy system and the perspective of a funding agency. So Jonathan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Thank you to Tip for the opportunity to speak on this webinar. Um, so as Jonathan says, uh, hopefully you can see my screen. As Jonathan says, uh, my name is Jonathan Hodges from Wave Energy Scotland. I'm an innovation, innovation and strategy manager. So my role is to develop innovation processes for Wave Energy Scotland um, and alongside that things like metrics, how you evaluate success in technology development and also how to identify areas of innovation that are that are important to progressing Wave Energy technology. So I'm going to give you a very brief introduction to Wave Energy Scotland uh, and in that our technology funding, technology development funding program and the stage gate process that it's based upon. And uh, then I'm going to move on to the International Energy Agency OES, Ocean Energy Systems Technology Collaboration Platform and the collaboration that that brings. Um, and in particular, I'm going to talk about a, a document which provides further guidance and consensus for funders in particular on how they engage with wave and tidal energy technology development. And then that's going to lead us more into the 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 key topic of the conversation today, which is all about standards, technical guidance and consensus, third party verification and, and the really important part of that risk management. So Wave Energy Scotland, hopefully most people will be aware of it. It's a funding program set up or at the request of the Scottish Government in 2014. Uh, with the objective, among many others, of developing cost competitive wave energy technology. And we've been doing that ever since through a Scottish Government funded research development and innovation program. Um, and one of the key parts of that funding program is that it has been run on a competitive stage gated process. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that um, and the importance of the metrics and the evaluation processes that that stage gate process is built upon. Now that developing that stage gate process and the success of it led us to become involved with a task run by the IEA OES, the Ocean Energy Systems Technology Collaboration Program. Uh, the OES is an intergovernmental collaboration between 25 countries with the intention of advancing research development and demonstration of, of power conversion technologies. Um, and through the performance metrics, 
work. Oh, something in my ears there. Um, we expanded on some of the work. Jonathan, sorry to interrupt you, but you're not sharing your screen anymore. Something just something just glitched in end? the matrix a little bit. Give me one second. Yeah. There, now you're back. If you want to go to full screen. Yeah, if you go to full screen, you should be all set. Is that on full screen now? Nope. All right, hang on a second. Thanks for your patience, everyone. Now you're there. Now, there now you're I'm there. there. Okay, I don't know what happened there. So, so having been active with running a stage-gated development program over the last uh, nine years now, we became involved with the OES uh, Performance Metrics Program. And that has led to the development of a piece of guidance, a document called the IEA OES Evaluation and Guidance Framework. And that has been done in partnership with a working group with the European Commission, University of Edinburgh, the United States Department of Energy and Technalia. Um, and that is a document which has a target audience primarily of public funders to help public funders engage with wave and tidal technology development. Uh, as Jonathan said, help them have a common language with some of the more technical guidance uh, and help them uh, support and accelerate technology development in this sector. So let's move on to the IEA OES framework uh, and what it contains. So these are the four components within the, the guidance framework. It defines a set of six stages. And these stages align with the technology development stages that Caroline just mentioned from IEC, going all the way from concept creation, which is an additional stage, all the way through concept development, optimization, and up to commercial scale device deployments and commercial scale demonstrations. For each of those stages, the guidance framework defines nine evaluation areas. And this is where we start to get into defining the language that technology funders can use to understand what's a good technology they should be funding. So these evaluation areas are the key characteristics or key areas of technical success that a good technology needs to demonstrate. Uh, and just to give a couple of examples, affordability being the top level, survivability, power conversion, controllability. Um, so we can go into more details of those uh, in another conversation. Now for each stage and each evaluation area, it then defines the stage activities. Those are the engineering activities that a funder would expect a technology developer to deliver within each stage. And then the evaluation criteria are the high level evaluation metrics or performance metrics that a funder should expect to be able to use to evaluate those technologies. And again, all this brings us common language and consensus on the language of what should be expected, what should be measured and what should technology developers strive to deliver in terms of performance. So that provides guidance to funders. Now, what, what benefits does that provide to a technology development funder? Primarily, it allows people to design a funding program, allows them to choose what stages they're going to fund, what evaluation areas and stage activities they want technology developers to focus on. And it allows them to provide clear expectation to applicants of where that technology should have come from, what its pedigree is, what technology developers done before to be ready for that stage. It, provide clear guidance and expectations on um, what data and outcomes the, the funder should expect at the end of the stage. And again, which areas of technology attractiveness they are, they are looking for. One of the most important benefits this brings to a funder is the ability to evaluate and compare technology using a consistent data set. And that's already language that we've heard a couple of the other speakers use today. Um, being able to use consistent data set, consistent methodology to be able to compare two things is, is extremely important for a funder to be able to choose most effectively where to apply the, the limited public funding that's available. So evaluation and comparison is a key, a key driver of this guidance. And what that then allows you to do based upon a stage gated process is to really clearly monitor progress, to be able to present that process, that progress for example, to governments from where the funding might be coming, to be able to very clearly and strongly manage risks and the impacts of those risks and be able to manage the impact of your funding program. 
we used to be in a situation where a technology development had to go quite a long way to very quite large scale devices before we had a real good understanding of what the risks were. But if you have a series of shorter stages um, all the way from concept, um, concept design, concept explanation, all the way up to larger scale demonstrations, you've got many more opportunities to assess risk and make decisions based on those risks. And that is one of the things that public funders and governments use and benefit from um, most clearly. So those are the benefits of the technology development uh, guidance to funders. But all of that is underpinned by standards. Um, and this is a diagram that I developed with Jonathan Colby and IEC and IECRE to be able to illustrate how the IEA OES framework links to and um, complements the guidance that comes from the other organizations that we're speaking about today. So IEC, ISO and IECRE. And this was our summary of how, how it all fits together. So the IEA OES evaluation framework is, is focused mainly on public funders, helping them to guide innovation guide selection of the most promising technologies and prioritize them and manage risk through the development process. Once you've selected those technologies and you've designed a funding program, you need to make sure that the technologies are developed in the right way. So that st IEC standards help to guide people to carry out their development, the design, the operation, assessment, and the quantification of risk in, in the right way. And then you keep going down that path through certification bodies and test laboratories. Uh, a lot of the technology that's been developed in our program has gone through various test tanks, such as FlowWave at the University of Edinburgh, and then on to European Marine Energy Centre, EMEC. So that ability to pass technologies on to an accredited test site is really valuable. Uh, and as is the, the ICRE system to be able to carry out that conformity assessment. And that's valuable not only to the funder, but the technology developers who go through the funding program. So I wanted to give a little example of, of how we've um, how we've benefited benefited from this process and how we've benefited from the third party verification that it enables. So the timeline up at the top is an example of our novel wave energy converter program. There's a very similar timeline um, now being used um, by the Europe Wave program. Which is, a, which is a funding program run by Wave Energy Scotland and our partners, EVE, the Basque Energy Agency, um, which has benefited significantly from using the guidance that's come from IEA OES. So the Novel Wave Energy Converter program consisted of three stages, Novel Wave Energy Converter 1, which was the concept design, and NWEC 2, concept development, and then large scale deployment in uh, the the, uh, one of the test sites at EMEC. So we started with eight projects, the stage gated process and they enabled us to compare those down selector four for NWEC two and then to two projects, motion energy and AWS ocean energy that you can see on the right hand side there. Now, every time one of these technologies was tested, either in a tank or in the test site at EMEC, we expected third party verification of the results, the performance results to be carried out by the, by the technology developers. Uh, in some cases that was carried out directly by EMEC and in some cases it was carried out by consultants or other companies who were able to provide that third party view. And what we found that that was really valuable for us in our ability to have confidence in the results of those tests in order to make effective decisions on them uh, to be able to understand what impact our program has. But also we, we found that the technology developers themselves gained exactly the same things. So they had confidence in the, the, their own activities. They were able to make innovation decision making for the next stage that they were applying for. And probably most importantly, they were able to demonstrate improved investability if they had been through a third party verification process of, of any engineering activities that they did during the program, that improved the message that they were able to provide to funders and investors as they continued their technology development program. So a really clear link between the, the, the sort of history of the Wave Energy Scotland program, the development of the IEA OES guidance uh, with other partners, development of new funding programs, and then the results of that underpinned by guidance from IEC and um, uh, other standards and certification processes. So 
just to summarize, we can go into a more detail of any of those in a further discussion, but just to summarize, I think this is how this is how the OES guidance fits in with the other uh, the other sources of guidance and um, certification. So OES effectively says what what should a funder expect, what should a funder ask for, and what language should they use to be able to engage technology developers. Once you've made that selection, IEC technical specifications, we have given really clear guidance on how that should be done, how the engineering activity should be done, and then verification of that those have been done effectively and correctly, and conformity with all of the um, the, the the guidance that exists, standards and certification processes really does lead very strongly into that investability and confidence coming out of the whole funding program, whether whether private or public. So I'll stop there. That was, uh, that was my summary of uh, engagement with Wave Energy Scotland, IEA, OES, and how it links very strongly into the subject of today's webinar. Pass back to you, Jonathan. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Jonathan. That's um, really relevant. A fantastic summary of the work at the international level. And as you know, but maybe not everyone, you know, it's been it's really it's been really enjoyable to collaborate with you and with the OES. And I think that for TC114, one of our key, key liaisons is with the OES. And I think you've done a really nice job of sort of showing why a group like the International Energy Agency and the OES and the IEC's TC114, it's so important for those two groups to work closely and, and collaborate together um, because we both bring different but critical aspects to the commercialization of this sector. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. really strong link. So, so Christina and Carolyn, if you guys would like to turn back on your camera, we have about five minutes. I'm not seeing yet any questions from the group, but I do have a question that I think each of you will have a different perspective on. And so, Christina, I'm gonna put you on the spot first. Um, no problem. So, you know, as we think about each organization, we've got three really different types of organizations, a developer, a lab, and a funder, and the OES perspective. So as we think about organizations and how to get organizations to buy into the use of standards and to buy into the extra effort that the standards and the certifications entail, can you talk just a little bit from Magallanes' perspective of how corporate buy-in was achieved? You know, what were some successful steps to prove to the C-suite executives or to the leadership that this was important. So I'd be interested to just hear from your perspective how, what it's like to get corporate buy-in for this work. Yeah, so I would say I have the perspective of that from um, the test site perspective and from the developer's perspective. Mm -hmm. I think that if the project budget, usually there's always some funding money. So if that funded money has is also, as West is usually, it's usually considering some money for bar performance or some mm -hmm. sort of third party verification with feasible deadlines as well, because usually we know that this sector is always, you know, things don't happen, depends on the web. But if there's some money from the project, then that's, and some demands from the project funders as well. I think that that's also helps. Yeah. Then I think also uh, from my perspective, if, uh, well, insurance bodies, for example, usually um, insurance is much easier to get if the certification is the device certified. So that also helps. So yeah, there's, and investors also they prefer if there's some sort of certification so yeah there are many many reasons why i think that it's yeah it's it can be done and it's interesting from yeah that's it yeah that's very clear very very clear carolyn if i could ask you from the emac perspective was there pushback to adopting a rigorous culture of quality and pursuing the 17025 and the 17020 and then maybe part b of that is now that it has been adopted, how do you see the impact of that kind of rigorous quality system permeating the culture of EMAC, if, if I would state it that way? So uh, EMAC was founded on, on the premise it would become um, a, a test site, that accreditation just seemed like a logical next step. 
and for this industry to follow in the footsteps of what the the solar PV and the wind energy have done. It, I think it's really helped to cement um, and accelerate the technology there. So um, it's it's important that that the marine sector can follow as well. Um, the quality and processes, um, you know, it, it's it's part of, of running a test site anyway. So I'd say that's kind of uh, yeah, it's been par for the course. Sorry, the second part of the question, Jonathan. How do you see it like permeating through a VMAX? So it sounds like it's in the fabric of it, but I'd be interested if you shared maybe how it like gets into everything that EMAC does in that way. Yeah, um, I think um, having having that kind of um, that kind of quality uh, mindset is really important. Um, and also EMEC is always looking within the sort of projects and the developers we're working with where else we can add value uh, in this, this kind of whole space. So, for example, in some of the, the measurements, the acoustic uh, characterization of devices um, and the environmental monitoring. Um, mm -hmm. So the acoustic processes and things and how the standards will influence those moving forward. I mm -hmm. think that's very good for developers to understand the kind of benchmark they need to be working towards. Mm -hmm. And also it allows for, again, standardization of that data to allow mm -hmm. sort of sharing of data much more widely. That's right. Comparison of data. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you for that perspective. So, Jonathan, from Wave Energy Scotland, as, as they've grown and the funding has, you know, evolved, how have you seen the... Uh, adoption of standards and the sort of culture of quality grow or similar to what Caroline described, has it always been in the fabric of Wave Energy Scotland? I think it's, it's always been in the fabric of Wave Energy Scotland. And as I said, that, that stage gated process has always been totally central to everything Wave Energy Scotland's done. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's become less of a challenge to persuade others that, that it's a necessary a source of guidance for all this engineering activity um and, and we certainly relied upon it to to ensure that particularly tank testing and and ocean testing is carried out in the right way and the data analysis is done the right way um i suppose one of the one of the easiest ways for pushing uptake of of guidance is to is for funders to expect it uh, which very uh -huh. quickly passes on to technology developers using it um in in our early stages of our funding program, we didn't specifically expect it, but we did implement the third party verification of all the tank testing stuff. Um, part of which was to assess compliance and use of, of the appropriate guidance. So mm -hmm. effectively that did, that did push all the developers towards using the, using IEC guidance and other sources of guidance and having EMEC and other organizations or other organizations deliver that third party mm -hmm. verification ties it in perfectly with the with as caroline said the kind of the growth of, of emec into that certification body yeah and i mean it's it's awesome like the three perspectives are so aligned you've got christina saying if there's money for it it's much easier if the funding agencies are demanding it but also giving a reasonable timeline to deliver on it that that makes it easier for the corporate sort of buy-in you know you've got caroline talking about the fabric of quality and how part and parcel with testing things like accreditation and quality management are, hearing you, Jonathan, say that similarly, that sort of fabric of quality is embedded in the work of Wave Energy Scotland, and that as you fund and provide the bandwidth for developers and the expectation of developers, that they all feed together. So, you know, I hope that for the audience that you can hear how these three perspectives align with each other and complement each other, that the developer needs the support of the funding agency the funding agency needs the test laboratories that can deliver on this, right? The, the funding agency, the developers to buy in on it so they can manage their own financial risk. The labs need the developers to be asking for these products to help make the business case at the laboratory. Um, so really the three of you have just been a perfect group to talk about the three different perspectives, but how similar those perspectives and how complementary they are. We did have two questions that came in on the Q and A. Um, and so Carolyn, thank you so much for answering those so quickly. Um, really appreciate that. We had one question just for those maybe who are just now looking at it. Who assesses the competence of the certification bodies and test labs and can they lose that approval? And Carolyn rightly noted that within the IECRE, we do what's called peer assessment. So a group of peers assess the quality of either the certification body or the test lab. If that body is deficient in meeting the rules, meeting the quality management requirements, 
you can lose that acceptance at the accreditation state, as I'm sure maybe Carolyn's about to note, that UCAS or the other national accreditation bodies are the one that would do that. In the United States, for example, testing competence is assessed by a, a group called A2LA, which is the American Association of Laboratory Accreditation. So you have these national accreditation bodies, or in the case of the IEC, you have a global peer assessment system. And then we had another question that asked about major tech developers having their devices certified. And, you know, I, I think you'll, if you follow the news, you'll see that many developers have what are called feasibility statements that are being issued. And this is what Christina showed as one of the early stages of the path to certification, where a technology qualification is conducted and a body will issue a feasibility statement on early stage technology. At the moment, we have none of our developers who've gotten all the way to a full certification, but as Carolyn noted, most developers, if not all, have the intention of doing these accredited tests. And as I think Christina nicely showed, we hope that more developers will consider this pathway to certification as a mechanism to enter the marketplace and improve that insurance and improve that, um, improve that access to insurance. All right, we have another question. Maybe this will be our last one. I, I think we can go just one or two more minutes. Any reflections on how the ICRE framework complements other standardization frameworks, such as those developed by DNV? And then is there ongoing cross collaboration between labs and bodies across such frameworks? Um, I'll start this one and then I'll open it up to the floor and see if there are any other answers. So the, the first piece of that is that the ICRE certification activity would, is based on international standards. So there need to be global standards to support a global certification system. So the DNVGL standards would not be directly usable within the IECRE system because those would not be considered international consensus-based standards. Now, DNV is a participant in the IECRE system and in particular in the wind energy sector and they offer services within the system. So we do see collaboration between the bodies, like a DNV, a Lloyd's Register, a Bureau Veritas, but the standards that DNV issues would not be used under a global conformity assessment system. I wonder, Christina, I'm sure Magallanes uses some DNV standards. I assume you use those to fill gaps where maybe the IEC standards haven't been published yet? Well, right now, we are in the moment where we are deciding with which um, certification body we are going to work with. So we are balancing the proposals and we are in that stage of deciding. All of them are quite, if they are not following exactly these technical specifications, their guidelines are based on them. So yeah, it's a matter of filling gaps, but yeah, all of them are based on them. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And then Caroline, maybe you could talk a little bit about international waters and how EMEC is working with some of the other test labs in the world to ensure that all quality management systems are brought up to the same kind of minimum requirement, such as the IECRE system. Yeah, so uh, the International Waters uh, Conference was set up uh, to bring test laboratories, and it's not just the scale sites like, like EMEC, um, so the full scale, uh, but also the, the, the tank testers, um, so lots of kind of research bodies, university bodies together. Um, and the, the focus there on standardization is really important to make sure that we are all assessing these technologies in the same way. Um, and the ultimate goal, I guess, going back to that question about uh, the uptake of the certification for the uh, the, the the techs with the power performance assessments and things, and the full certification, we will see that come out more and more as uh, as and as uh, is, is one of the uh, number of developers who are on the cusp really of that kind of next stage of commercial advancement, and it will mean that uh, site developers can then make. Um, an informed decision about which is the the most appropriate technology for them and i think having that sort of benchmark there is, is really important um, and yeah international waters leading into that sort of whole process is is really really important yeah i agree i think that's very important and as you mentioned you know emec is one of i believe only two accredited labs in the world and you're the only open water accredited lab for marine energy and so you have sort of set the bar for quality management of test labs in marine 
And if we can have the other test labs bring up their quality management and bring up the quality of their testing, I think that's going to benefit the whole industry broadly. So yeah. appreciate it. There's, there's a whole piece around the sort of standards um, and, and, and record keeping and data collection. So there's, there's many, many facets to uh, the, the total quality management system for that's this right. space. That's right. That's right. It's non-trivial. It is Indeed. non-trivial. <laughs> that's for sure. Jonathan, maybe we'll end with a comment from you on this topic. I, as you all look at this work, I, I assume you see the value in the international standards and really prefer to see developers using the international standards and the international frameworks? I think I think the international nature of it is very important. I used the Wave Energy Scotland program as, a, as an example throughout, but effectively the IEA OES guidance is being adopted by more and more public funders around the world. And if they've also got the same route to um, further guidance, more technical guidance of the of the how everything should be done, and they've got onward path to accredited test sites like like EMEC, then that international collaboration, that international alignment of, of the expectation expectation builds builds the effectiveness of our guidance as well. It's yeah, very yeah. very complementary as you said. Yeah, and I know you've used a word like a passport for technology, and I see that as a as an ICRE certificate because that certificate that's based on international standards allows a product to move into different marketplaces globally. And so it can be seen as an analogy to a passport for the technology as it, as it moves globally. Um, Certainly, yeah, I, I've stopped using the language um, of technology passport because I think, it, yeah. I think it was causing confusion that I was trying to create yeah. something new, but actually, yes, exactly. That's why I see Ari does. Um, and that passport cool, yeah. really does help people move from one jurisdiction to another. Yeah, and that global certificate can act in that way. Excellent. Well, um, Lotta, I think with that, we'll start to wrap up. Um, I, I think the panel has been fantastic from my perspective. You just heard Christina share that the major certification bodies globally are engaged in this work. It's up to the developer to ask and demand that the products that they're paying for are considered under the global system so that you can have that transportability. We see EMEC is working to bring up and helping support the other labs and understanding the importance of quality management the importance of global third party verification. And then we've seen from the funder, you know, and from the perspective of OES, the importance of these international consensus based standards. And so I hope the audience has seen the value in international standards and certification, the risk reduction, the acceptance, the reducing barriers to markets and global trade. And I hope Lotta and Pablo that we've done what you asked for and hoped for for ETIP. And again, it's been an honor to moderate this and a real pleasure to, to sit with Jonathan, Carolyn and Christina as always. Thanks from my side as well. Thank you um, for our panelists and thanks Jonathan for your moderation. And as I mentioned, this recording and the slides will be on the ETIP Ocean website in a few days. So you can, you can view them there. Um, Thank you to our, our audience as well. Hope to see you in the next webinar. Have a nice afternoon and evening, everyone. Bye. Thank you all very much.